I'm going to read from verse 13 in Galatians 5. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envyings, drunkenness, carousings, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Heavenly Father, to venture into your word is to tread on holy ground but thank you that in these words we find life because we find the Lord Jesus. And we pray now that you would, through your Spirit, help me in the speaking and help all of us in the hearing and in the living out of your word. Amen. I came to faith in the Lord um, at quite a young age. But looking back now, um, I can see that for many, many years, I functioned basically with half of the gospel. I knew how much I needed the forgiveness of sins that Christ had provided for me to be cleaned up and to, to receive the gift of eternal life. But whilst the message of God's forgiveness through the cross relieved me of my guilt and it gave me an assurance of where I would go when I died, it didn't give me the power to live here and now in the way that I knew I should. I found that the most challenging thing about living as a Christian is not the past, which Jesus has dealt with. It's coping with life in the present. Do you find that? You see, what would be the point of Jesus picking us up out of the mud, <coughs> scrubbing us down, getting us clean, putting us back on our feet again, 
only for us to take one step forward and then to fall flat on our faces again. Because we not only need the power of God to forgive the sins of our past, but we also need the power of God to help us not to repeat the sins of the past. And God recognizes that, which is why he's given us the power of the Holy Spirit to live within every Christian. Too many people, it seems to me, try and live the Christian life by huge efforts of the will. Believe me, I've tried it. And it's not possible. With all the effort and determination in the world, could you genuinely live like Jesus for just 24 hours? Of course you couldn't. And God knows that, which is why he gives us his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given that we may live as Jesus lived, on an altogether higher plane. One of my favorite illustrations is of the um, old lumberjack in Canada many years ago. The chainsaw had just been invented and he went to the store to buy one of these fancy new gadgets and he was promised by the salesman that it would increase his production fivefold. And so he got up very early the next morning and he went into the forest and he worked from sun up to sundown and he looked at his production at the end of the day and he saw that he had actually cut only half as many trees as he normally would. And that was obviously frustrating to him. And so he went back the next day into the forest, getting up even before the sun had risen, and he worked twice as hard as before, and barely got his production up to two-thirds of what he was doing before he got the chainsaw. And he thought there was something was wrong with this saw. And so he took it back to the shop, and he complained to the store owner that this thing does not seem to do its job. So the shopkeeper picked up the chainsaw and he said, OK, well, let me test it to see what's wrong with it. So he pulled the starting cable and the saw fired up. Vroom, vroom. And the lumberjack jumped back in, at, in amazement and said, what's that noise? But you know, it's quite sad that many Christians live in that kind of relationship to God. They've come to know Jesus Christ, and yet they haven't drawn upon his power to enable them to live their lives for Christ. They're still trying to do it in their own strength. And that lumberjack didn't understand the means at his disposal some other source of power or energy, the motor, had been designed for exactly that job. And likewise, lots of Christians are worn out and frustrated because they are relying on human effort they don't understand the power that exists in their life already through the gift of the Spirit. It seems to me that so many Christians are living, so to speak, between Easter and Pentecost. Um, or, or perhaps to put more precisely, they're living between the Ascension and Pentecost. We've received the Great Commission but we don't yet have the great compulsion. 
<laughs> and the Bible's teaching is that we need to enter into the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And that comes from Pentecost. Just as Easter is repeated in a believer's life, in that we have to die with Christ, we have to be buried with Christ, we have to be raised with Christ. Just as we have ascended with Christ, as I explained a couple of weeks ago, in the same way Pentecost needs to be replicated in our lives. And yet on Pentecost Sunday, um, most Christians just seem to reflect and look back on something that happened 2,000 years ago, as if it was a one-off event. But everything that happened at Pentecost 2,000 years ago was meant to happen again in my life. I am to be crucified, I am to be buried, I am to be raised, I am ascended, I am to be filled. These are not just historical events. These are things that establish a pattern. Jesus is called in the New Testament a trailblazer. The one who went ahead and showed us the way to go. And so there's a real sense in which I follow him in that way. And the difference the Holy Spirit makes is to enable us to live as Jesus lived. And that means the ability to live at a supernatural level, which ordinary people would say is impossible. You see, we simply have to come to grips with the fact that it isn't just hard to live the Christian life. It is impossible. There are just so too many obstacles that prevent us from succeeding or from overcoming. Um, I'm reminded of the little village in Wales whose name I can't pronounce, but it's somewhere near Snowdonia. And, and some years back, the residents there were, were having a real problem because th the village was being overrun by sheep. And so the villagers had put up um, fences and, and the roads had cattle grids installed. But the sheep had still managed to get in because they had learnt to get in by rolling over the cattle grids on their backs. <laughs> now, the power of the Holy Spirit is given to us to similarly roll over any obstacles that get in our way and inhibit us from living the kind of life that Jesus lived. We can't overcome those obstacles in our own strength. But Christ's power is made perfect in our weakness through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And essentially, the challenge of Pentecost is to face up to our own inadequacy. It doesn't sound like an exciting thing to do. But in many ways it is the first step to the fulfilled life which God designed us to have. And it certainly was for Simon Peter. He needed it desperately. And it can be for the first step for us as we face our inadequacy uh, in the grace of God. Um, you remember Peter how he betrayed Jesus, not just once, but three times uh, in, in the space of a few minutes. It's all described in the Gospels. Jesus had been arrested. Peter follows from a distance. He's interested, actually probably concerned, to see what happened to Jesus. 
Uh, and Peter considered himself, I think, to be one of Jesus' most faithful followers. And perhaps he was. But he had to come face to face with his own inadequacy. In the power of Christ, I mean, he'd already witnessed miracles and, and, and God had used him and the other disciples in great deeds and healings and things like that. But now, here, when the crunch comes, he's challenged by a young servant girl. And he denies Jesus three times. He wasn't willing to identify himself with Jesus. You think, how could he do such a thing? And I'm sure Peter had such an incredible sense of regret afterwards. A, a deep, deep sense of failure. Disappointment's probably too weak a word. It was, it was discouragement, maybe even despair. His heart must have ached. And the Bible simply says he went out and wept bitterly. He knew that he hadn't lived up to what he had originally professed. But if you notice what happened to Peter on the day of Pentecost, this is only a few weeks later. Uh, when you reading the, the story of Pentecost um, in Acts chapter 2, in verse 14, it's Peter, it says, who stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and declared to the crowd, Men of Judea, and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, give heed to my words. And he went on to give them the gospel message with both barrels. He said, you crucified Christ. And that took courage, didn't it? Something has changed in Peter. This is a different man. A, a, a few days prior to this, a few weeks, he, he couldn't even admit to a servant girl around a campfire that he knew Jesus. He'd acted like a coward. And now, with thousands gathered for Pentecost, he's addressing this huge crowd, and he dares to stand up and command attention of the entire multitude. This is a different Peter. Something's happened. What's happened to this man? And quite simply, Pentecost had happened. Encountering God's power had happened. Being filled with the Spirit had happened. A transformation had happened. Peter appears different because he is different. Something's happened to the man so that he's now operating not in his own ability, but in God's sufficiency. He's moving by the power of God. And the Spirit is in control now. And this is precisely what makes for living the Christian life, the way we were intended. It is living in the power of the dunamis of God. And so Peter's uh, cowardice was changed, turned into confidence. But his confidence wasn't in himself, it was now confidence in God. And I think he began to understand what the Apostle Paul would later write when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And this was as a result of encountering the very presence of God through his Spirit. In 
just a couple of chapters further on in the book of Acts. Chapter 4. Peter and John are standing before the religious leaders. They're in trouble. And it is said of them in verse 13. Now, as they, the religious leaders, observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and they began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. That's a change that had happened in their lives that had transformed them just from just a few weeks earlier. It was obvious. And when Jesus begins to live the Christian life through people, things are noticeably different. Now, I don't mean that you become like a manic boy scout doing a perpetual bobber job. It's not just living a life of performing good deeds and, um, and helpful kindness. We are to be kind, yes, we are to do good. But you don't need the Holy Spirit for that. For the simple reason that people who aren't Christians can do exactly the same thing. If all Christians gave themselves to Meals on Wheels and Red Cross and Help the Aged, it wouldn't prove anything. Atheists and agnostics can just as easily do this. As many atheists and agnostics have sent money to alleviate the suffering in the Ukraine, as Christians have. But the power of the Holy Spirit brings about changes that other people can't easily imitate. I'll give you an example I, I've heard a while ago of a, a second-hand car dealer uh, who, after his conversion, started describing his cars honestly, which was unheard of in the trade. And, and uh, he would begin to say, well, um, this looks all right, um, but the engine is shot. Um, or, uh, it's a nice car, but it's been in a prang and the chassis subframe is a little bit compressed. Or we'd say there's actually rust underneath which you may not notice. And people couldn't believe that he was being honest. Um, they, they thought it was a, a gimmick, some kind of reverse psychology to try and pull the wool over their eyes or whatever. But you see, for somebody who's a second-hand car tradesman to be telling the truth about his cars you could say, uh, demonstrates the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not uh, saying that all second-hand car dealers are like that, because, um, uh, but it's, it's the kind of uh, example of living uh, a standard that is far above what you would expect, far above everybody else's ability. Um, when you can say, Jesus saved us from our sins, that people know that that's actually true because they can see that it's true. You see, the, the, the thing which is so important to grasp is that the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. And it is so obvious that we miss it. But if you get filled with the Holy Spirit, what should be the result? Holiness. And the holiness of God is the most vital thing about his character that we need to grasp. Because when you get filled with the Spirit of God, it's his holiness that's going to be the most obvious thing that shows. And Christians, the church, are often missing 
the number one reason why the Holy Spirit was given. The Holy Spirit was given that you might have the power to be holy. Because that is what God commands in Scripture. If you turn um, in your Bible, still in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 44, it says, I am the Lord your God, consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am holy. And if you go forward to Leviticus chapter 20, they so repeat it again, you are to be holy to me, because I the Lord am holy. Then you go to the New Testament, and in 1 Peter, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Beginning to get the picture? One more. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Make every effort to be holy. Without holiness no one will see the Lord. I mean that puts it pretty clearly, doesn't it? Have any of you tried being holy? If I can put it another way, try living like Jesus. It's not easy, is it? There is this thing called the sinful human nature that constantly gets in the way. We don't actually have the capacity within ourselves to be holy. The Old Testament says that even your most righteous acts are like filthy rags to God compared with his holiness. Does that depress you? Well, it doesn't have to because that is why God gave his Holy Spirit. And the essential quality of holiness is Christ-likeness. And when you read the way that the disciples describe Jesus' life, when they are praying in the book of Acts, this is in Acts chapter 4, there is one adjective that keeps cropping up, and it's worth noting it. In Acts chapter um, 4 and verse 27, they're praying. Herod and Pontius Pilate met to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus. A few verses later, chapter 4, verse 30. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. That, in the eyes of the disciples, was the defining characteristic of Jesus' life. That's how they described him. And the whole purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit is to enable that holiness of Jesus to be manifested in your life and mine by giving us a freedom and a power not to sin. You see, however supernatural and miraculous the gifts of the Spirit are, without holiness they are not going to change the world. Because the world has got quite used to people who can do amazing things. But that in itself doesn't point to God. It's the character of a person's life that points to God. It's enabling people to see the life of Jesus being lived out through you by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And you know, if, if our lives as Christians from Monday to Saturday are no different from our nice next door neighbours who never go to church, then how can we expect them to believe that Jesus is alive? You see, God isn't visible, is he? But Christians can be seen. Christians are the living, walking, talking icons of the Lord. And so if, go if God's going to be seen by the world, he's got to be made visible by the way in which he lives through us. If people don't see in us a higher quality of living and righteousness than they can possibly reach themselves, why should they see any need to be a Christian? If our businesses are run the same way as theirs, why should they believe the gospel? There's no difference. There's nothing to confirm that Jesus has saved us and the Holy Spirit lives in us and affects the way we behave. If it doesn't touch on the most basic things in our lives, <clears throat> somebody once said it should show even in the way you drive. I don't know if you'd feel guilty about that, but you know you do see some people with fish symbols on the back of their cars, uh, on their bumpers, and um, you look at the way they drive and you think, well, I'm not sure about the witness there. But you see, God isn't just interested in saving us from hell. He's interested in saving you to something and for something. In other words, God is in the business, to, to, to use a modern expression, of recycling people. I mean, what is recycling? It's, it, it's actually salvaging, isn't it? It's to take what would be thrown away as rubbish and to make it into something useful again. And God not only wants to save us from hell, but recycle us into people who can be useful for him by the quality of their lives, reflecting the image of Jesus. And his Holy Spirit is the way he does this. Some people think that the Holy Spirit is given to us primarily to make us feel good, or for exercising spectacular gifts like healing or speaking in tongues. And yes, the Holy Spirit can do that. But he is primarily given to us to enable us to live a little bit more like Jesus every day. And that isn't always seemingly spectacular to us. Because it is the Holy Spirit who helps us to persevere and keep trusting God when a crisis happens. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us the discipline to read the Bible and to pray every day. It is the Holy Spirit who gives us the grace to forgive when people have really hurt us and abused us or taken advantage of us. It is the Holy Spirit who gives us the ability to love unlovely and unlovable people. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us the power to break habits and addictions and behavior patterns that have got a grip on us. It is the Holy Spirit who gives us the strength to overcome anxiety, fear and worry in situations where we're normally tempted to panic. Now, I don't know whether you see those things as being spectacular or exceptional, but I'll tell you this. Those are all things that ordinary, unbelieving people would struggle. They wouldn't manage it. Have you ever considered what God's number one goal is for your life? It's not to make you like Billy Graham or Mother Teresa. 
God's number one goal for you is to mold you into the image of Jesus. Full stop. Um, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, <clears throat> it puts it like this, um, if you will forgive me on this one occasion for quoting from the Living Bible paraphrase. From the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him should become like his son. Isn't that incredible? God's number one goal for Tony Ward is for me to become like Jesus. Can you think of anything less likely? But that is why he gives me his Holy Spirit. The one thing that is impossible, humanly speaking, is taking place bit by bit through the Holy Spirit within. <clears throat> I said at the beginning that for years and years I functioned with only half the Gospel. And so my prayer is that that doesn't happen to you. When God fills you with his Spirit, it's not to give you goosebumps and a bless up. It's to make you like him so that the world can see the invisible Jesus through you. Isn't that an amazing privilege? And how does it happen? And, well, let me end this morning just by spelling out the how very briefly. I'm sure you know that the New Testament <coughs> was written in Greek and there are peculiar tenses um, of the verb in Greek. And there is one tense in particular which is crucial, um, which is called the present continuous tense. And it means to go on doing something. And to translate into English, you've got to add the two little words, go on. Um, <clears throat> for example, Jesus didn't say, and this is in the context of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> Jesus didn't say, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. He actually said, go on asking and you will receive. Go on seeking and you will find. Go on knocking, and it will be opened to you. And you know, somebody says to me, well, I once asked for the Holy Spirit, but nothing happened. And my responses say, well, Jesus said, go on asking. How much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who go on asking? For him. And if you really want something, you do go on asking, don't you? When your children want something from you, they persist, don't they? Daddy, can I have an ice cream? And you say, well, not yet, it's nearly lunchtime. And after lunch, can we have an ice cream now, please? And an hour after that, Look, Daddy, there's an ice cream van. They go on asking. And in the context of, of Luke chapter 11, where I've been quoting from, Jesus says, go on asking for the Holy Spirit. He talked about a neighbor. Um, <coughs> he talked about uh, this person knocking up his next door neighbor's door and goes on knocking until he gets them out of bed and he gets what he's, what, what he's asking for. So go on. It's not that God is a reluctant giver, but sometimes he needs to know how badly we want what we're asking for, whether we're actually genuinely serious. If you only ask once and then give up, 
then it's an indication usually you're not that desperate for whatever it is you're asking for, are you? Some preachers will tell you <coughs> um, a technique, if you like, for being filled with the Holy Spirit. As far as I can see, the scripture simply says, ask persistently in faith. And when God sees that our heart's desire is for this blessing, without us making any conditions or qualifications, when we become thirsty and expectant, then God will lavishly, generously pour out his spirit on us. Someone once said, God only fills empty vessels. Um, there's a sense in which I, I, I think that's true. And what we mean, <clears throat> may need to do is just to come to the place of emptying in our own lives. We may need to come to the place of brokenness. That may be the very thing we need to give us the right perspective. The perspective we need in order for God to begin his work in us through his spirit. And that may be the preparation which we need for our own personal Pentecost. It was for the apostles. And it was for Simon Peter. And it can be for us. Amen. I thought that perhaps we could just close maybe by making our prayer of asking um, verbalized in uh, that song, Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me, break me, melt me, mold me, fill me. Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me.